Welcome to Invention Stories on YouTube. I'm your host, Robert Baer, and you're watching Shy Tag, episode 53 of the Invention Stories podcast with Mary Cousin, founder of the Chicago Toy and Game Group. We first shared her story on the audio-only Invention Stories podcast back on May 17, 2018. Please be sure to subscribe, comment, and like. Now let's roll. We didn't have something that really targeted families. And so I came back from Essen, and this was in 2000, 2001, and I thought, I'll just start the Chicago Joint Game Fair. How hard can that be? You know, everyone loves to play. You're listening to Episode 53, our interview with Mary Cousin, the founder of the Chicago Toy and Game Group, Shy Tag. Mary is one of the most influential people in the game and toy world today. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mary Cousin to the Invention Stories podcast. Mary, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start off by asking, what kind of kid were you, Mary? Uh, did you enjoy playing with toys or were you into an artist or what kind of young person were you? So I loved my light bright and my easy bake oven. I was always baking something in the easy bake oven and I still love to bake to this day. So I very much believe that the toys and games we played with as kids influence our lives later on. But I was one of those really good kids, you know, senior class, president, homecoming queen, all of those sorts of things. I, I, uh, high grade point average, I guess I was just a good kid. Did uh, school come easy to you? Were you a quick study? Well, I mean, I I did study a lot, and, and I worked hard, but I think I put a lot of pressure on myself to go above and beyond as well, always getting involved in whatever I could be involved in, and always trying for that straight-A average. But I, I loved school, and I I had a lot of friends, and it was a good time. I see that you went to Notre Dame, and then you went to Loyola. Why did you choose those colleges to attend? Well, interestingly enough, my father went to Notre Dame, and he didn't think that girls should be at Notre Dame. And so I was going to show him that girls could indeed be at Notre Dame. And so I made it a point of getting in there, and probably not the best reason to choose a school, but that's why I did. And then Loyola... The reason I got my MBA from Loyola was because I was living in Chicago, and they gave a lot of credit for classes I had taken at Notre Dame because I was a double finance major. And so it actually it made it was very easy to go to Loyola. It was near where I worked in downtown Chicago, and it, with the extra credits that they gave me, I it cut off a year from my MBA, which was great. That makes sense. Are you from the Midwest? I am. I grew up in Indiana, out in the country, only an hour from Notre Dame, actually, and an hour from Chicago. So I haven't really, I travel a lot now, but I've not really lived much further than a 60-mile radius from where I grew up. Why do you think that is? That's a great question. I think once you set down roots in a place, I don't know, that's a really great question, because I do love to travel. I don't know. Doesn't mean I'm always going to be here either. I could move in a couple of years. It's hard to say. I think a lot of people choose their areas because of family, and they've got a lot of family, and they don't like the idea of living too far. I just happen to live here in California, and it's absolutely spectacular today. And every time I look back east or the Midwest, it's it's frozen, it's cold, and it's snowing, and it, so those things just come with the territory of living there. You, you don't sweat it or anything. You're used to driving in icy conditions. I am. I am used to to the weather here. And, you know, sometimes you have to, if you go through the bad of winter, if you will, then the rebirth of the ground and flowers and green in spring, there's a real high to that. And, yes, my family is from here, so it makes it very easy to see all of them. In Chicago, though, I have to say Chicago is a great city, and we were just named number one in the country by Condé Nast as the best big city. We have the best restaurants in North America, I believe, was part of the rating, the highest educated population in the largest cities, the number one place for foreign investment in the world. 
the highest number of female entrepreneurs. I mean, the list goes on. It's it's quite impressive. It's a good place to live. Okay. You said you were the uh, class president. Did you have a really big class? Right. I was. Well, I was class president for two years in a row, and yes, we had, our class had like almost eight hundred kids in it. Wow. So you were sort of always somebody sort of leading, even when you were young. So it didn't make you nervous to speak in front of large groups of people? You've always been comfortable with that? Or do you get a little butterflies before you start, and once you start, you're fine? Or No, I don't like speaking in front of groups, actually. I didn't then, and I still don't. I, I'm just not comfortable doing it. I mean, I have to do it, obviously, but I'm not comfortable doing it. I just assume not, but... There are times when you can't avoid it. I was reading that you like to do a lot of volunteering. You were working with uh, the American Library Association. Uh, what were you doing with that? You were trying to get, well, what were you doing with that? <laughs> so I was on their Games Literacy and Libraries ad hoc committee. And what we were trying to accomplish there was get games into all the libraries because libraries are becoming that third place or a community place for people to go. And so I was getting game manufacturers and toy manufacturers, one more game, to send games to libraries. And the first year that I was on that committee, Hasbro sent a Picturica game to every library in the U.S. And they said that it actually cost more to package them and then postage than it did, you know, the actual cost of the game itself. And then we got them I think it was a couple of card games the following year, and then we had other game manufacturers doing it regionally. It was a very successful program, actually, to get the games into the libraries. And I know there's a lot of inventors and companies, and and I know myself included, where we donate a lot of games that we have to local libraries for kids to play and families and game nights. And, you know, a lot of libraries have kids in them after school gets out their kids stay there until their parents pick them up so it's a great place to be donating toys and games too it sounds like you're trying to encourage kids to uh use their minds in a healthy way and i enjoy playing games and uh do you enjoy playing games yourself do you spend a lot of times playing games or is that just kind of like work now <laughs> funny well i do enjoy playing games and actually I started in the industry as a game inventor but the truth of the matter is, is I don't play games as much as I used to because the busier I get, the less time I have to play games, unfortunately. But it is, you know, it is a great way for people to get together and families to spend time together. And also, you know, there's all sorts of studies that show that people who play games tend to have a higher IQ. It's something called strategic intelligence because they learn how to think strategically and I'm sure you might be familiar with the studies where all serial killers have one thing in common, and that's that they didn't play as a child. Scary thing. But... It's a good reason to have your kids play games. You do a whole lot of things. You do a lot of mentoring for the Innovation and Entrepreneur Initiative at Northwestern. You're a judge at the Kids at Play Interactive Awards. You're a moderator on one of the LinkedIn groups, a very big busy group. Uh, you're with women and toys. And, and of course, what you're doing here is is you're the uh, president and founder of Chicago Toy and Game Group. And there's so much that you do, like your work-life balance. How do you how do you know what to do when and how do you know what to focus on? Well, much of what I do is synergistic. I mean, when I'm working on an inventor project, it generally benefits something that has to do with our events. And right now I'm working on some get-togethers. We host get-togethers around the country and sometimes the world. So we have one in Milwaukee coming up, a Chicago one, one in Israel, and one in London. So I'm working on the four of those and where I'll be making connections with more people in the industry. And a lot of my friends are in the industry. So, or most of my friends actually are in the industry and in that so the balance is is I don't know if you're passionate about something I think that and you enjoy what you're doing it's not as much work right it's it's just something you enjoy and it makes you happy and and what you accomplish in that makes you happy and it's just it's just not work 
any longer or as much work. Obviously, there's always something you have to do that you don't want to do, but it's, um, it's a lot of fun. And we're so passionate about what we do. You know, the core of everything that we do promotes play. That has always been our core. But we think one place that the industry has not done well in helping to promote play is promoting their inventors. And this is why I know so many inventors, because we do promote them. And we believe that if inventors, toy and game inventors, were treated like their creative counterparts in music and film in restaurants and in the literary worlds, our industry would have a bigger piece of entertainment pie. It's like Tim Walsh says, he says that if you sell a million CDs, you're on a cover of Rolling Stone, a million books, the New York bestseller list. But if you've sold over 60 million Jengas, like Leslie Scott has, no one knows who you are. Leslie, she's awesome. I mean, she is awesome. Twain Game Inventors are really creative, awesome people. And so many of them are my friends. And that's, you know, so the whole work balance thing goes out the window just because I do. This is my tribe. I love these people. And and I think by promoting them and making them more of celebrities and, and telling their story, because especially because today, Consumers really want to connect with the products they are purchasing. And so telling the story of that product, which includes how the inventor came up with it, will sell more products. I see that you're the president of Discover Toys and Games. Is that different or is that part of? So in, when I started in the industry, I was actually working in real estate, but I was inventing toys and games on the side. And after doing that for a few years, which included self-producing games and and licensing games, I started helping other inventors because to exhibit at, a, at different toy shows, it's very expensive. And if you only have one or maybe two products, you're spending a lot of money to do that. And so I started Discover Games, and this is over 20 years ago, to help other inventors. And it was, it's like an inventor co-op. And we would show their products at Astra, at New York Toy Fair, and now at Shytag, and then give them reports on what people thought about them. And they could also be in the booth and interact with people, but not spend as much money as you would need to if you had a whole booth to yourself. And it was because of Discover Games, I went to Essen in Germany and saw firsthand a show that invited the mainstream families and kids were playing and they were playing in aisles and it was really a very exciting show, something we certainly didn't have in the States. I mean, we have hobby shows in the States and cons in the States, but we didn't have something that really targeted families. And so I came back from Essen and this was in 2000, 2001. And I thought, I'll just start the Chicago Toy Game Fair. How hard can that be? You know, everyone loves to play. Well, it is a lot harder, right, to start an event because, as it turns out, families have so many options of things that they can do that it took a while for us to grow and find our sweet spot. And in the time that we are, the weekend before Thanksgiving, we have a very loyal following and a lot of fun to go to the show. And we have traditional media and and social influencers, families who really care about toys and games and finding out what's the newest thing out there, and they talk about them. They're out there telling their friends about them. So it's a really great place for grassroots marketing, and it gives us the opportunity to introduce inventors to the public, which they love meeting inventors. It's a great thing. So when you were first starting, you said that you would all rent a booth together and you put different inventors together to sort of share the cost. Were some of their games or toys, were they kind of all over the place or along the same lines, had some commonality and put those together? There was no commonality. It was just a diverse range of all types of toys and games, mostly games probably, but all kinds of toys and games. You never knew. I mean, a lot of them were award-winning, but the one thing that they had in common was that, in general, the inventor only had one item, possibly two. They were not a line or, you know, a big manufacturer. That's a smart way, because usually when I talk to inventors, they've got a single product and they could go broke pretty quick trying to promote it. But sharing cost, uh, 
seemed like a really smart way to help the inventor. I, I applaud you for that. But uh, I want to get back to the Chicago. You started your own show just from yes. scratch? Yes. And how did you go about that? So I looked at different venues. I knew it had to be a large one, which limited it. So there was really only a couple in, in Chicago that fit the bill. Navy Pier is perfect for that. And I will say that it took eight years of keeping my real estate job while growing the Chicago Toy and Game Fair and its related events. Um, it, it, you know, to reach that, to reach a certain point where you could let go of your day job took longer than I anticipated, for sure. But it did allow me to keep going. A lot of times, you know, in, a, in a way, I'm an inventor in that regard, too. I invented a show, right, in the States. And a lot of times inventors just don't have the money to keep going. They may have a great product, but they can't afford to keep going. And so you just have to, sometimes you have to do the hard thing, like have two jobs more or less while you're, if you believe in what you're doing and why you're growing it, sometimes you have to keep that day job. That's good advice. I guess it's up to the individual you see people who wind up losing their home and everything because they do quit their job and do it focused until you, I guess, till you catch on and start making money. But I, I think, right. let's say I, I'm tired of playing the game of life. You know, it doesn't seem very realistic. I've got my own version I've created with my kids or my wife or whatever. And, you know, instead of getting money for kids, you wind up, you know, spending more money on kids or whatever, or just any kind of variation on some kind of game or what should I do? What? What would you recommend somebody do? Well, I always recommend that they attend our inventor conferences. We have three tracks. We have one for the professional inventor, of which you can find the inventors of Jenga, Poppet, Twister. I mean, I could go on. Like they, they're and part of our professional track. And then we have a new inventor track. And that's where the new inventors or, or a small company can come and learn more about the industry and then we have a third track and those are the product acquisition executives and last year we had almost 90 of those product acquisition executives from companies like Hasbro, Mattel, Spin Master, Lego. Lego sent two people from Denmark, um, Play Monster, really big companies from here and around the world. Actually we had people from 25 countries and it is the largest gathering worldwide for toy and game inventors to pitch their products. And the beauty of that is they don't need an agent. They are talking one-on-one -on -one with these companies who generally will not see an outside submission. Like you mentioned the game of life. So if you're a new inventor and you've invented a variation of the game in life, you're not going to get into Hasbro because they just don't have the bandwidth for that. They, get over 1,200 new inventors asking for someone to see their ideas, and they don't have the bandwidth. And what they do is they send out a list of agents that you can use to try to get in front of Hasbro, and those agents, and we're on that list, and those agents do have an audience with Hasbro. But also, they recommend on that list, they recommend that you attend our conferences because they're there. They send two, three, four people to the conferences to find new ideas and new products. And if it's something like a game of life extension, you're really only targeting one company there because Mattel is not going to pick up something that's a version of the game of life. And by the way, the inventor of the game of life, Ruben Klamer, who has been to our events many times, and we honored him with the Lifetime Achievement Award several years back. I had dinner with him in San Diego um, in January, and he is just the loveliest man. And so he's 95, and he is still pitching products. Wow. Well, if, I know. He, if, if he loves it, like you said, if you love what you're doing, it's not work, or you don't mind working and doing it. But no, I, I, they say, you know, that you should stay busy. And if, if you love doing it, hey, why not? Um, it's true. Okay. I wanted to kind of be specific and ask you it's a chicago toy and game group and you started the chicago toy and game fair in 2003 when you started did you have trouble filling the uh, auditorium and like today for example or this next year 
like how many people will you have or how many booths will you have? So my first year out, it took two years to get enough people excited about the idea of a consumer show because when you're the first one out there trying to convince mainstream companies to show and it's a show that they're they it was hard for them to understand the benefit of getting directly in front of the consumer so it took like i said a couple of years and of course me i thought if essen could get seventy-seven thousand people in the middle of you know a small city in the middle of germany a city like chicago with six million people within a driving an area that could just drive in I thought for sure I could get 100,000 people. So I told everyone I would have 100,000 people there. And also because Navy Pier, I started it on Labor Day weekend, which is also the pier's busiest weekend. They get 800,000 people there. And so I thought, well, this isn't, you know, this is a piece of cake. Well, it's, well I think we had about 5,000 or maybe just over 5,000 our first year. And those people were not necessarily interested in toys and games. They just happened to be on the pier and they saw that there was a toy and game show and they just thought they'd come through and see what it was about. Since that time, we've moved it to the weekend before Thanksgiving when people want to know what toys and games are hot. And so that was a smart move because we now get tons of media. And also the people that come, they're not on the pier you know, in November, just to be walking the pier, it's too cold in mid-November. They are there. If they're on the pier in mid-November, they're there to be at our show. And so the the people are focused and really interested in every exhibitor and what's going on. And it's, you know, our sponsors come back every single year. Our big exhibitors come back every year. It's really good. It's a good thing. What chai tag? It's Shy Tag in Chicago. We're known as Shy Town, and so there's Shy Host. There's well, Shy Town. There's Shy Irish. There's Shy. Everything is Shy something. But I guess that was lost on the rest of the world, right? When I said Shy Tag, Chicago Toy and Game, it made sense to me being from Chicago, but it didn't make sense to the rest of the world. But it's caught on, and it's good now. Wanted to make sure I covered everything. I. I know that that town probably exploded like nothing else when the uh, the Cubs won the World Series about a year ago. That's uh, true. It yeah. was crazy. Uh, but getting back, I, I also see that you, you're a commissioner on planning and zoning the Board of Appeals Board, or you did it for 10 years for the village of Lincolnwood. Now, um, when people are appealing things, it's usually because they're not happy with the actual ruling in the beginning. Why did that appeal to you to become the commissioner on the planning board? In fact, I also see you've been a trustee. You 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 do a lot of uh, community service or working with the community. Why was that important to you? I think everybody needs to give back to their communities and get involved and know what's going on. Um, so I started on the park board when my kids were smaller and got involved there and making our parks a better place and a more fun place to play. And then from there, I did run for a city council position and won, thank God, and won and spent four years on that board. And boy, you I have to say, you learn a lot about politics in general, but and we're a small town, though. We're you know just under 13,000 people. So I did that for four years, but while I was on that board, every city council member has to be a liaison to other boards. And so I was a liaison for a few years to the zoning board and the planning commission, and I liked that. And and also, since I'd been in real estate, it was something I knew a little bit about. And so when my time was up on the village board, I went to the planning commission and zoning board and spent, yes, yeah, so just so I think it was just over 10 years there. And you just sort of burned out or ready for a new chapter? Is that why you moved on? Well, actually, Shy Tag got really busy, and I just didn't have the time to devote to it. Because if you're going to do something, you need to put the right amount of time into it, and I wasn't able to do that any longer. So it was a good point for me to leave the zoning board because we also have our conferences and our Toying Game Inventor of the Year awards, and we had Play Chic starting, and our Young Inventor Challenge growing, and I just I needed to devote 
more time to these events. You're a mentor in Women in Toys. Why is that important to you? Well, I think for women in particular, it's it's harder to to get ahead and make your mark. And so I think if we can help one another, whether it's giving a contact at a company or just giving advice on a better road to take or an easier road to take, you need to do that. I mean, it really brings everyone up. If you help someone else, in the end, it helps you. And I've always been an advocate of that. And the same with the mentoring at the Kellogg School at Northwestern. I And really, our Young Inventor Challenge, too, it's mentoring young kids to invent toys and games so that we're building up that next generation to come into our toy and game industry. And in fact, a kid, well, he's not a kid any longer, but a a guy, uh, Nick Metzler, who won our Young Inventor Challenge when he was 16 years old, who then got his game licensed by PlaySmart, and it is still today on the shelves. So seven years later, it's still on shelves around the world selling. He then went to USC, and upon graduating, Spin Master hired him for their game design department, and he's flourishing there. So now I get to see him at New York Toy Fair, for example, and he comes back to Shytag, and he talks to the young inventors, and he mentors via Skype a lot of young inventor kids, like school classes that take on the Young Inventor Challenge as a class project. He will he'll Skype with them and give them advice. It's nice that you try to help somebody and then you'll, it must be kind of rewarding seeing them being successful and growing and and doing well. I think it's really probably just as important or not important. You're trying to reach some young person and they're on the wrong path. It's very easy for them to be on a destructive path, but any little kid or most little kids could invent and that's creating and it gets their mind into a positive thing. So I think it's great what you're doing, trying to reach the young gang developers. You seem to be just a complete juggernaut now. I I see that you've got uh, 1.3 Chicago Game and Toys. You have 1.3 billion media impressions in November, and your monthly e newsletter reaches under 245 thousand people. That's pretty staggering. Uh, how did you do that? How have you been able to just keep growing and growing? And and what do you expect to do like in the next five years? So the the media impressions, I can't take all credit for that. We have a fantastic PR team and a social media team. Brilliant PR does our PR, and we have a couple of people on our social media team, Allison Ray and Nicole Regan, doing our social media. And the two, the Brilliant PR and, and that team, they are amazing, and they work together so well, and they get us tremendous, tremendous media. And of course, it is the week before Thanksgiving and the holidays starting and Black Friday. And so a lot of people want to know what's hot and what's going on, but they work it and they work it hard. And it was exciting to get media all across the country and overseas for our events. So that is a tremendous and amazing. And as far as the newsletters go, so we have many different newsletters. So we, our industry newsletter goes out to over 40,000 people. Our games education newsletter goes to over 130,000. A consumer one to over 15. Inventor one to over 17,000. I might be missing. Oh, media and blogger to about 7,000. Well, let's see. Social influencers, I think 5,500. And then media, 7,000. So, yeah, it adds up very quickly. And we worked hard at that to build those lists and, of course, people opting in. And it's taken many years, 20 years to build those lists. Yeah, it takes time and it takes dedication, it takes money, it takes planning. And it looks like you've uh, achieved some really great results. Do you enjoy writing? Just something that you're good at or do you just like to write what you're passionate about? So I would never consider myself a writer necessarily. I mean, I do have to write intros for our newsletters and sometimes interviews require answering questions. I mean, I hope my passion comes through in my writing. I really do. But I would not consider myself a gifted writer by any means. It's just it's just a means of getting our story out there. If somebody created a game, obviously you're recommending them to go to your show, but 
Would you recommend them go to specific shows like bigger toy shows? Are there specific ones that you think are really good? Or would you recommend them go to as many shows as possible? Well, to go to many different shows, you'd have to have a very large budget to be able to do something like that. And most new inventors don't have that, especially if they've spent money on a prototype or a production run. I would say, first of all, as I I said earlier and you just mentioned, I think the most effective way, if they're looking to get licensed or noticed, is to attend our inventor conferences. And I know Target comes out to our show and they, they find products every year at our show, like Clask and Otrio. And, you know, these are products that that Target discovered at our show. And then if you do have a lot of funds, and if you're in the U.S., most new inventors, the natural course of things is they would start in specialty retail and then move to mass. And so the place where you reach the most specialty retailers is if you exhibit at Astra, which is this June. It's coming up. It'll be in New Orleans. And then if your budget allows, and I would say New York Toy Fair, If you're in the States, those are important shows. If you're overseas, I would recommend the London Toy Fair or the Nuremberg Toy Fair. And in fact, the Nuremberg Toy Fair is the largest toy fair in the world. I think they had 2,900 exhibitors last year, almost 3,000 exhibitors. And to give you a sense of scale, New York Toy Fair had 1,000 or just over 1,000. And they're actually... 10 times the size of New York Toy Fair. They have 13 halls, and many of those halls have a first floor and a second floor. The booths are bigger in general, and they believe in the relationship. Like, you know, come into my booth, have a cup of coffee or a cappuccino, some prosciutto, some chocolate candy, because, you know, we should get to know each other. And maybe we won't do business together this year, but maybe we will next year or the year after, or maybe you'll talk to somebody and tell them about us. It's all about relationship building and Nuremberg, whereas like a New York toy fair is more, or Astra, it's more about business. Although Astra, I shouldn't say that Astra is, is a very friendly show. Like they pay for your meals. They encourage everybody to eat together. They give you ice cream in the afternoon. It's a very friendly show. And there's over 500 exhibitors at the Astra show. So each show has a bit of a unique character if you will. Our unique character is more inventors and consumers. It makes us different. We get trade, you know, not as many as other shows, but it's it's really consumer and inventor focused innovation. I always think you should begin with the end in mind. If you're trying to sell a game and you, you think like, wow, my game would really be good in this store or on this platform. Do you recommend that or do you just kind of keep it open for people? What do people ask that question then? Yes, we we know people do ask that question all the time, and we do keep it open. And in fact, at our conferences, we present both paths equally so that the attendees can make their own decision. We tell you the risks and the rewards of going down either path. And of course, if you don't get licensed, like if that is your first goal is to get a licensing agreement and you don't get licensed, Many inventors, new inventors, if they really believe in their product, then they will, sometimes they will self-produce to show the companies that they missed out on a great product and and then the next year they come back and they show their sales and how well it's doing and then they have a shot at getting licensed, if that makes sense. If there's one person or two people that I should try to interview for the Invention Stories podcast, who would you recommend? Well, Kim Vandenbroek would be good from the Game Isle. Because she not only is an inventor, a very successful inventor, but she runs the gameisle.com. And so she knows a lot about games in general, and she can speak to them. Another interesting one would be Peggy Brown, because she doesn't just invent toys and games. She writes books for the uh, Golden Book series. She she does housewares. She She's produced a film. She's very interesting. She's been on the Rachel Ray show as her craftsperson. Tim Walsh is another interesting one. Tim invented, his line is the one I quoted earlier. He started as an inventor of Tribond, and he's done other games and toys. And he has multiple books and multiple 
films under his belt, and now he has a game company, Geta Games, and he's doing well with that, and he's a speaker. He goes out on speaking tours, so he would highly recommend him. He was the host of our Taggy Awards for eight years. It was incredible. I think those three, I would highly recommend them. Oh, another one, Dan Klitzner. He's a board member. He does our Young Inventor Challenge with his wife, Alicia Alexander, who is an educator in Marin County, California. Dan invented Boppet and Perplexus. Simon's wife, hundreds, hundreds of things he has invented, and he would be a great one to interview, too. Actually, I could give you a list of hundreds. <laughs> the more I'm thinking, it's like, oh, yeah, and this person and that person. And really, these our twin game inventors are incredibly interesting people. I keep seeing STEM toys. I never used to even hear of STEM toys. Now I can't get away from them. What is really popular right now? What is super popular? Well, I'll tell you, at New York Toy Fair, it seemed like everybody had a poop game. Honestly, it was like poop was the thing at New York Toy Fair this year. I've never seen such a theme be so prevalent before. It's interesting. So you have intricate games like, you know, very thematic and rich games like Euro games that have become so popular. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have high face and poop games, like any, you know, toilet flushing games. And and those have become very popular. It's, it's really a f- funny. And games in general have been up double digits for years now. Every year they keep climbing. So it's obvious people want to spend time together. And game cafes are popping up everywhere and doing extremely well. So yeah, and you're right, Steam, huge trend, STEM and Steam in schools. You'll see a lot more game playing, and that goes to why our Young and Better Challenge is doing well, because that is a STEM activity. Parents are looking for it because they know that those are important. You know, all their kids should be doing STEM-type projects, so they buy STEM toys and games. They are definitely selling well. Other trends, construction toy. I mean, play is good, and I think people are starting to understand that more. You know, the thing is, in a country like Finland, and Michael Moore is doing a documentary on this. In Finland, when they dropped kindergarten as the type of classroom where you come to learn your ABCs and one, two, threes and and all this sort of thing, and instead went for more of a play-based curriculum where they're playing outside and they're playing with, they're, you know, just playing with all toys and games all day long, the scores rose years later. In the long run, those kids who have a play-based curriculum do better. And you can see that, right? It increases your imagination and it builds more connections in your brain and it socializes you and it makes you more creative. And and I think that's why Google and and other high-performing companies have play spaces for adults because play, no matter what your age, makes you more creative STEM or not STEM. I mean, look at Cards Against Humanity, how popular they are. And that's an adults for the most part, and even intergenerational, which is really interesting. Seems like there's not only a lot of toys, but there's a lot of inventions in general that have to do with your phone and being connected to the game itself. Have you noticed that as well? Um, yes. But that's a form of play, which is good. All play is good. 